Frank, let me give you two periods of time. One yeah. is today. We see lots of different forms of matter. Things look well organized. I'm very comfortable here in your home. Thank you very much for your hospitality. <laughs> and then let's take the moment of the Big Bang in this incredibly energy-filled, very high temperature, extraordinarily dense thing. How could matter have formed from that event? Well, the matter was already there in the sense that there was the energy, there were lots of quarks and anti-quarks, <laughs> plenty of ingredients to make everything uh, we see today, in fact, too much. So the right question is, how does matter survive? If we had initially the same numbers of quarks and anti-quarks, they would all have annihilated to very high accuracy and nothing would be left. So the reigning picture is that in the early universe you had quarks, say here's five quarks, and anti-quarks, four, and uh, they annihilate and just one man is left standing because he's the oddball. Uh -huh. Now that was five against four. The reality is more like a billion and one against a billion. <laughs> This tiny asymmetry between uh, quarks and antiquarks, or if you like, between matter and antimatter, is what survived from all that stuff to make the matter we see today. So we have this asymmetry between the formation of matter and antimatter. Yeah. That sort of doesn't make sense. It was a big surprise when people discovered experimentally that the behavior of matter and antimatter is not completely parallel and symmetric. This occurred in the 1960s. It's a tiny effect, experimentally, uh, discovered by uh, Cronin and Fitch and their collaborators, and they got a Nobel Prize for it. As well they should. <laughs> as, as well they should. It's a very fundamental discovery. Uh, theoretically, it wasn't really absorbed until uh, at more than a decade later. Uh, because if you write down sort of the simplest equations for antimatter and even the simplest equations for the beginnings of the standard model, you find that they don't permit asymmetry between matter and antimatter. Mm. It's only when the equations reach a certain level of complexity that uh, they naturally support a difference between matter and antimatter. And in fact, it requires that you have at least six kinds of quarks for that to work. <laughs> and this actually was the way that the existence of the fifth and sixth quarks was uh, predicted even, even before it was discovered experimentally mm. by uh, Kobayashi and Muskawa. That's one of the great triumphs of theoretical physics, but that's uh, a big surprise. <laughs> and, and all coming from this unbelievable asymmetry between matter and antimatter when before that people thought it should be the same. That's right. So just because it seemed more elegant, first of all, and then secondly, because the simplest equations you can write down do have that symmetry. Mm. So it's only when things get a little more complicated that, uh, that the possibility of asymmetry arises. It was a big surprise experimentally and uh, only later really got incorporated into the theory. Well, one but could argue that, that if you, they were the same and you had all these un innumerable quarks and antiquarks, right. maybe some of them couldn't find each other to annihilate. Yeah, you can calculate that effect. That turns out to be quantitatively very small because uh -huh. the universe, by particle physics standards, expands very, very slowly. So these guys have plenty of time to find each other. <laughs> And mate and explode. <laughs> mate and explode, if you will, or turn into a uh, lighter thing, light right. or neutrinos or something. Disintegrate. Uh, that's, uh, that's cheaper to have, <laughs> basically. So the equilibrium drives that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can actually calculate that effect, and if that were the effect, we'd have roughly a billionth as much matter as we have have now, and also it would be patchy. You'd have matter here and antimatter there. Ah, and that would right. lead to problems where today yeah. they maybe sometimes meet each other. That would lead to 
big explosion. Yeah, That's yeah. quite an understatement. On <laughs> right. That would be total <laughs> but anyway, annihilation. So there seems to be a, a systematic overall imbalance. And uh, with our deeper understanding of the laws of uh, physics, we've got some ideas for how that might happen. In fact, there are several ideas, and none of them has is easy to test experimentally, so we don't really know what the inside dope is, the details of what happened, but it doesn't appear to be an insurmountable thing. Uh, first of all, you need a way of producing different numbers of quarks and antiquarks. So this is called non-conservation of baryon number, which is really... The number of quarks in the world today is almost exactly conserved, and that's what underlies the stability of protons. And that's called conservation of baryons. It's really just conservation of quarks. So you can have lots of processes in which you produce quarks and antiquarks, but it's always got to be the case that the number of quarks minus antiquarks that you start with is the same as what you end up with. But initially... But initially, uh, there are processes that don't obey that. And these, or we don't, haven't actually seen it. People have looked for proton decay for instability experimentally, but so far haven't seen it. But our theories become much more beautiful if you change the equations to allow proton <laughs> decay. Uh, and um, we think we're on the right track with that, although we don't have a specific concrete theory of how it could have happened. So let me see if I have this right. At, at the beginning, th th there was a complicated word beginning, I know, but, yeah. but this incredibly dense, hot right. energy, right. and that from that, through Einstein's, you, you had the formation of quarks and anti-quarks from this energy. Right. They're a form of the, form one, of, one, one way in which the energy embodies itself, if you like, is but there's an imbalance, a slight imbalance. A slight imbalance, or it may have been at the very earliest times there was accurate equality, oh. that would be the most symmetric, but then there are processes that are not quite symmetric, and so there comes to be a systematic little imbalance that at first is hardly noticeable. You have a billion plus one of <laughs> quarks and a billion of anti-quarks, but then they almost all annihilate until just this little guy is <laughs> left over, and that's 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 us. That's everything that we think of as ordinary matter. So uh, stars, planets, galaxies. 